So Jennifer, thanks for taking a minute to uh, sit down with me. You had a great keynote presentation this morning at uh, our conference here, ISC, and uh, Joe's been telling me to get the whole name in there. So the International Conference on Medical Device Standards and Regulation. That's a mouthful. So that's why we say ISC. But you're our opening keynote this morning. Thank you for that. And you spent time talking about opportunities really uh, in terms of bringing new medical device innovations, especially AI and software enabled devices, et cetera, to market. Uh, So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. But before we do that, tell folks a little bit about who you are. You wear a lot of hats. (laughs) Thank you, Robert. And of course, thank you to the Amy FDA and BSI community for having me this morning. Fantastic conference, fantastic content. I myself am learning so much here. You know, my role, I, I sit within a large academic medical center, UCLA Health. I am the executive director of UCLA Biodesign, which is an early stage medical innovation training and development program for aspiring innovators. We really give innovators the tools to succeed in early stage entrepreneurship in the health tech sector. I wear a few different hats at UCLA. I'm an associate professor of medicine and management. And in that role, I also support innovation at UCLA Health. And really the the combination of those faculties enables me to kind of have a wide scope view of the total product life cycle. Mm. And really our goal is to see technology get to patients. And innovation drives a lot of that technology development. So I was really happy to talk to everyone today and share a little bit of the work we're doing to kind of raise the bar for advancing innovation in med tech. And you were sort of swarmed after your keynote this morning. I saw the second you came off the stage when people had so many questions for you because you do have insight into the total product life cycle starting earlier than most of us have exposure to in this community, that very early stage R&D, those, those early stage innovators. And, and that's an area of focus for Amy um, you know, obviously our focus is, uh, you know, bringing safe and effective medical devices to market, but a medical device that's not available to a patient can't help a patient. So we can't lower our standards, no pun intended, uh, in terms of the, the quality of the medical devices that get to market. Um, so the only way to it, it really um, uh, expand availability is to expand the pipeline. And that means making the regulatory process as streamlined and efficient as possible, making standards as clear and actual as possible, et cetera. So, but before we can really better serve that market of innovators, we need to better understand them. And the work that you shared with us this morning, it's why you were swarmed, really helps us better understand uh, those innovators that are, that are driving that very early stage of the product pipeline. So a lot of what you shared with us was based on a study that you all conducted. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Robert. I'll just say that, you know, before diving into the study itself, safety and efficacy are always at the forefront. Mm. At the same time, we need a pipeline, like you said, of innovation, innovative devices to reach patients. And a lot of that innovation comes from early stage companies that are eventually acquired within the industry or a small percentage, as we know, will will have an exit event in the Mm. public markets. So our focus in terms of the study was really to understand In the past decade, meaning from 2010 onwards, what has been the impact of regulatory policy on innovation in the med tech and health tech sector? Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was driven by an early report in 2010 that indicated the FDA was lagging some of its global counterparts in terms of predictability, transparency, and a host of other factors that showed it took much longer to get to market in the US than the EU. Now. Mm -hmm. I had a hunch. And the net result of that was companies choosing to launch their products in exactly. the EU versus the United States, right? Exactly. And right. myself and some colleagues, we, we had a hunch. We said, I think things have changed. I think there have been some driving factors that have potentially created more of an innovation friendly environment in the US from the regulatory perspective. We also felt that the cost, in some ways, had. I don't want to say it's come down, but there's a range of costs associated Mm -hmm. with obtaining regulatory approval. And when you're a startup CEO, you're always thinking about cost and time to market. Those are two metrics in which you're primarily judged in terms of fundraising, as well as a host of other milestones. And so we really wanted to quantify what are the new metrics for cost and time to regulatory clearance or approval. And the reason that's so important, because as, as you know, Funding the med tech sector has remained relatively flat over the past 10 years. Which is surprising. Surprising, certainly given all the innovation we've seen in the space. So where is the money going? 
Mm. It's going into the health tech sector. It's going to digital health. And when you and I say digital health, often the word or the term SAMD comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And so when we're thinking about software as a medical device and understanding the opportunity for funding and innovation in either software as a standalone product, software and hardware as a combined product, or for example, your traditional medical device that's not interconnected or, or operationally enabled, that's a really interesting question that we wanted to learn more about. And so that's exactly what we sought to do. We interviewed 102 companies, about 105 different product experiences. Mm. We spoke to 40 different stakeholders, such as Amy, such as AdvaMed, such as md &M, as well as several other global med tech innovation organizations, such as Enterprise Ireland, Enterprise Singapore. Mm. We really wanted to capture the global perspective. And I'll just say as a footnote, there are many med tech products that make it to market. We sought to really understand first in class innovation, mm -hmm. meaning not a product line extension, not an incremental feature add on, really a product that's first in class to market. Because often those products face additional challenges outside of, of a PMA supplement or otherwise. Right, and so right. that's what we did. I and mean, I know we'll get more into exactly what was some of the findings, but the goal was to set those med benchmarks to really understand in 2022, over the past decade, has the landscape changed for innovation in the US and on the global front? So what were the key takeaways? Has it gotten better here in the United States? I know the answer, I was there this morning, but folks that, that are watching are gonna to wanna to know. <laughs> yeah, cer certainly, Robert, and it's a great question. And I would say across the board, 79% of our respondents agreed that the FDA is responding favorably to advances in medical technology. Mm. Now that's a sea change from 10 years ago where the data was showing a significantly different perspective from industry stakeholders. And, and that, that, the sample there was folks that were getting, uh, as you said, devices to market that were in new territory. These were, they didn't necessarily have a long list of predicates. So, so these are some of the more challenging uh, uh, op regulatory moments, right? And, and it's that group that's reporting a positive result like that, that it's really improved? Exactly, and just because you're innovative doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have a predicate device, perhaps, right. because as we True. know that there's an extensive library of, of predicates. So the bulk of the companies or products that we sought to understand the experience of were 510Ks, okay. which was supplemented by both de novo and PMA products as okay. well okay. to get kind of a broad swath, if you will, of product experiences. That was also distributed across different clinical review panels mm -hmm. with the bulk of our products coming from, of course, cardiovascular, radiology, neurology, orthopedics, the product categories that make up the bulk of regulatory approvals, as well as samples from the other review areas as okay. well. Okay, so the, the, gen, the top headline takeaway is things have improved uh, in the United States. So we've seen a shift now to bringing products to market in the United States as a primary choice versus other markets? Certainly, and that, that's, I think, another kind of one of the big differentiating um, results is that 53% of companies in the survey actually shared that they are deprioritizing the CE mark. Mm. Now, one might immediately think MDR, Brexit. There's a multitude of factors that have changed the European regulatory landscape. And while it's kind of hard to untangle changes in U.S. regulatory policy from international regulatory changes, one can suppose, based on the qualitative feedback from our survey respondents, and when I say survey, I mean we conducted one-hour in-depth interviews with each mm. of these regulatory leads or CEOs um, at length over using a specific um, survey instrument, it was clear that many of the policies in place, such as the Breakthrough Device Designation Program, such as the current guidance for software and AIML products, as well as guidance that has preceded those around clarity for general wellness devices, has led to a better understanding of the regulatory landscape in the U.S. And has that resulted in a commensurate drop in time and cost to get to market versus 10 years ago? Well, that's a good question. And so we actually did look at exactly that in order to make sure we captured the right companies. Were these companies representative of the average cost and time mm -hmm. to market? And so within our sample set, the average length of time to review, if you will, was 153 days, which mm -hmm. is pretty much on average with the historical trends over the past 10 years. We should keep in mind that every product 
medical devices right. you need. Averages are not that helpful when you have such variety, but it's, it's directional. It's and directional. so we looked at median and average times mm, okay. and costs. Right. And so we found um, data that supported around um, $6 million for a 510K in a period of just over 30 months on average for cost and time to 510K okay. approval, which is a significant difference from the data benchmark of 10 years ago that was suggesting a number of 30 million for a 510k clearance. And now and again, once again we're talking averages, but from yeah. 30 million to 6 million is a significant difference. And whether there's clinical data or no clinical data required mm -hmm. can obviously significantly alter the impact of an approval. However, the the clarifier here is that it is possible to get 510 day clearance for a truly novel innovative product at that cost of regular you know time right. to clearance you at still least have someone's to get your product done it to market. yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's, it's it been is doable it's, it's been, been proven. Done. yeah one yeah. one company in fact i i know i actually know the innovator uh, personally as well put his 510k in his credit card <laughs> it's possible and when we say we bootstrap we mean bootstrap That's in the startup community right i'm impressed yeah absolutely so, so let's let's uh, sort of peel into another layer of this, and th that is the mix uh, that you've spoken about between what might be considered sort of a traditional medical device and software-enabled or connected or AI-enabled AI devices. Uh, you said just a second ago that um, the funding is really flowing in that direction. Uh, it's been relatively flat in the traditional med tech space, and I don't mean to misstate any of these labels, so if I get it wrong, correct me, but but in this sort of new space, that's where all the, the funding is going, so that's where we would expect the bulk of the innovation is coming from, and therefore the bulk of the demand for clear guidance, clear standards, and clear regulatory pathways. How, how big of a shift is this? I mean, uh, how big is that market? And, you know, you don't have to be exact about it, but in, and, and is that... It, are we still in the early part of the wave, or is the wave getting bigger, or where are we in this in this kind of shift towards digital health? Yeah. Fantastic question, and I think it's, it's fair to say that digital health eclipsed medtech funding early in 2015, 2016, right around that benchmark, and the field really took off. Now, one might say that correlates mm -hmm. with the advent of the FDA's clarification on general wellness guidance. Oh, that's interesting, the chicken right. and the egg so argument. It, yeah, we, yeah. We, we won't get into, you know, um, <laughs> that discussion, but, you know, there might be There's a good harbinger timing there. on FDA's yes. part. There you go. Yes, because <laughs> I know many startups at the time who were seeing trepidation, if you will, from the investment community due to the lack of clarity, mm. again, because of the risk associated with needing a regulatory clearance. And so as of, 20, you know, the end of fiscal year 2021, Digital health funding, depending on the source that you cite, is pretty much a 5x or more of traditional medical device funding. Five times as much money going to that side as the traditional. Wow. And so the question is, is how do we as an industry capture some of that funding? How do we provide standards and, and regulatory policy that enable devices to adopt those software products? Mm -hmm. Interesting. So it, it adds another layer of urgency uh, to the work that we do. Not only is there the safety issue, there's the, once again, the access. If we don't get these devices to market, they can't help anyone. Um, and, and, and what you're saying is that really the funding's the leading indicator. I mean, I guess is the way I'm thinking about it. And so if we think about what's the work of the next decade, this is it, getting this clarification in place. Otherwise, we're going to tamp down an industry that has a potential to, or, or a set of innovations that has a potential to do a whole lot of good for patients. Um, so what, so is the, you, you mentioned the sort of certainty. That is the pri one of the primary drivers for folks that are putting funding into these early stage startups. It's really the clarity of guidance, clarity of standards, clarity of regulatory. It really is that important? Certainly the predictability, mm -hmm. yes, in, in terms of budgeting, in terms of planning, in terms of understanding what is your clinical trial burden. Now, mm -hmm. one can be said that the breakthrough device designation, you know, which is uh, sort of was established by previous pathways that are now today called the breakthrough device pathway. Many have thought, thought and we talked about it this morning, as sort of the golden ticket, right? It's like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Mm -hmm. If you had a breakthrough device designation two years ago, the ease at which you could fundraise was thought to be far greater. Now, that's not to say the breakthrough device designation has become you know, mundane, if you will. It's still <laughs> a very coveted 
um, designation, there's just under 700 today that have been issued by the FDA and only 52 that have been approved or cleared. Yeah. So the bulk of those products are still sort of in situ in that regulatory workflow process, either beginning clinical trials, finishing R&D, and it remains to be seen sort of what are the product categories that will emerge? Mm -hmm. Are they combination products, you know, software plus hardware? Are they standalone software? How does that relate? And we don't have enough data points yet to say how are SAMD products comparing to traditional medical device hardware products in the regulatory workflow? But that data set is growing. Mm. And we will, and you know, we say what's next? We will have a data set in the next few years to really dig into and say, well, what does it mean to be a SAMD product? Mm. What does it really mean for cost and time using historical data over the past few years? And how do we get that done? Mm. How do we get, how do we, again, what are the opportunities? What are the opportunities to make it better, to make it more transparent, to make it more predictable, and also to enable innovation on a global landscape? Because right. certainly as MDR, or kind of, I don't want to say the fallout, but you know, the fallout from MDR, quite frankly, rolls out, we'll see what the opportunity is in the EU and the UK and what we can also well, now, Yeah, you have a very there. different thing emerging in the uh, UK and we heard from MHRA today talking about they really want to be the laboratory for uh, regulatory innovation mm -hmm. and create a, a hotbed of innovation where they are. And uh, we're, we're all in favor of that. That's, That's exciting. fantastic. Yeah. yeah, we'll see see what happens. So so let's stay with the future focus for a minute. So you wear so many hats, you're doing so many cool things. And I said, I think what, what I hope to see is our community uh, take advantage of the kind of data that you're developing, the kind of research that you're doing to better understand where our activities can be uh, most useful can be planned and be most useful in the future. So what are you doing next? What's happening? So this was a, a study that was a 10 year comparison, right? Mm -hmm. You had one about 10 years ago, you had another one. So you're going to wait another 10 years or what do you have in the, yeah, <laughs> what do you have in the works in, in the meantime? <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I think we talked about it a little bit earlier in our pre-discussion, but you know, getting regulatory clearance or approval is just a stepping stone to market access. Mm. And we need to be able to have a way to pay for whatever the product is, for the most part, outside of you know a few self-pay categories, to get that product to patients. Now, whether that's falling under a you know bundled payment or a per member per month model, there's many new business models that have emerged, as well as new product categories that we don't yet have the infrastructure within CMS or the private payer landscape to appropriately define and cover those products mm. and so i think step one is understanding what happens after clearance and approval and what are the opportunities for innovation in that space but also understanding how do the choices that are made around standards around predicate devices how do those impact downstream reimbursement mm -hmm. how do those affect adoption in the patient setting or otherwise because often a predicate can define your reimbursement path in some ways. And I right. talked to several startup CEOs who wish they had done reimbursement planning sooner because I, I say it sometimes, but you know, in some ways reimbursement is the new regulatory. And is so that, what does that mean? It, you is know, that seen as the final sort of gateway that you have to get through? Um, I think so. I think 10 years ago, it was considered to be regulatory. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of, you know, lack of transparency, lack of guidance, et cetera. And now that's evolved. And that's really what our studies sought to do is say, have we evolved or not? Mm -hmm. And if we have, well, where do the barriers still remain? Right. And right. I think that reimbursement is one of those areas where we have work that we can do, but also as a community being mindful of, again, that total product life cycle. And as we're thinking about post-market studies, as we're thinking about different real world evidence kind of data points we're collecting, how do they all connect? Well, that, I right? threw out chicken and egg earlier. That's really a chicken. And so, so prove to me that your device, especially a lot of the tools now have a, a pop health underpinning. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so prove to me that your device can produce the results in a, in a population that you say it can. And then the, the response to that is I have to be in the population at a scale that allows me to do that. So we've been, we've been talking a lot about real world evidence 
and and data and you and I talked about that some offline and that'll be a whole nother conversation but um, closing up the gap and how long it takes to collect that data and I mean that's where academic medical centers and other institutions like that come in but th there's a there's a real challenge there and especially we were, there was a whole conversation uh, the first day which you were here with uh, with uh, Dr. Ehrenfeld from AMA around AI and and you know that that that's a whole different uh, issue in terms of you know which version of the algorithm you're actually collecting data on when with the, you know there's there's all kinds of things there but it all leads to us um, needing to get to more data faster at greater scale and greater efficiency to solve that problem of prove to me it works you know yeah. not just in, it, once again for these tools that have that sort of focus population help but I'm sure for others as well so all right, so we're going to stay in touch. Whatever you do next, we want to know about it because <laughs> it's going to be interesting. Well, I, I definitely so. look forward to it. And I think, you know, the health systems are the missing link in that. Just like you said, when we're thinking about how do we create the entire data package, how do we link product performance across a patient with multiple comorbidities? Right. And so I, I think there's real opportunity for health systems to come into this piece of the puzzle with generating real world evidence, with kind of plugging in and helping device manufacturers better understand product performance and then ultimately develop standards that help better refine and predict that performance. So there you go. Thank well, you. We're Robert. in it together. <laughs> thank you so much. And thanks for uh, being here this week. And uh, I'll come out and see you in sunny California next Please time. Please do because <laughs> it's already cold in October. It is indeed. Thank you. Thanks.